Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Lynch, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon affiliated with St. Vincent's Medical Center, and I'm here to talk to you today about total knee joint replacement. The first step of talking about knee joint replacement is a little bit of an anatomy lesson. It's a complex mechanism. It doesn't just move on a pivot and it doesn't just roll back, but a combination of gliding back and forward. And that's important for consideration of knee joint replacement and how we plan to fix problems that have gone wrong. There are important cushions inside the knee. There's articular cartilage, which is the cartilage that coats the end of the bones. And then there are these meniscus pads, which are also important cushions and stabilizers of the knee. What holds the whole thing together are the ligaments. There's the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. Cruciate is Latin for cross, so these cross in the middle and they help to control the motion of the knee. And then there are two stabilizers on either side, the medial and lateral collateral ligament. So what can go wrong? Well, these cushions have a limited lifespan, sooner in some people than others. They wear just like the tire on a car, and over time, this can lead to problems inside the knee. You can see on this slide here, with the knee bent open and showing you its weight-bearing surface or the part that interacts when you're walking, that there are areas where the cartilage is intact and still cushioning, and yet there are potholes in other areas and worn areas, and it's the progression of this wear that leads to the ongoing bone-on-bone -on -bone and then the development of pain and dysfunction. Now, some people have some wear or a lot of wear and don't have much pain, and some people have a little tiny spot, and it can be incredibly painful. So we can't base it all based on the degree of wear, but it's helpful as we evaluate and go forward. And we can look at this a little bit to see what it looks like on x-ray. And if you look on the inside of the knee, you will see that the space is very narrow as opposed to the outside where there's more generous space. Now, that space isn't a space. It's the layer of cartilage on the femur bone and the layer of cartilage on the tibia bone and the meniscus in between making that space. And you can infer on the other side of the knee that that space has gotten thinner. As we watch with progression, we can see that here on the outside of the knee, this has progressed to what we call bone on bone. The femur has kind of dropped down into the tibia and is wearing a groove in there, and we can start to see the formation of little spurs to the side, which are osteophytes. You can also see in this x-ray that the knee's becoming more angled, in this case, knock kneed And that is a part of what we try to address when we consider total knee joint replacement. But we don't just jump in and do surgery. There are a lot of things that you can do to manage your pain prior to the need for surgery. I counsel patients that you wanna be as old and as thin as possible before you have your knee replaced because they too have a limited lifespan like your knee did getting here. So what can we do prior to consideration of knee replacement? You can do lifestyle modification. If you were running marathons or had a house with a lot of stairs or could in some way change the amount of activity that you did to more gliding activity and give up walking and running or do less of that in favor of gliding activities like an elliptical trainer or a bike, you may get some more miles out of your knee. Always a delicate subject, but the knee sees five to seven times your body weight every time you climb a step. So if you lose a pound, you lose five off your knee, and 10 or 15 pounds off a knee can sometimes extend somebody's comfort level and extend the time that they can enjoy their native knees before having to consider knee joint replacement. Exercise and physical therapy can help. Generally, a knee that's getting arthritic is not being used as much. The muscles around it don't work as well. If we can strengthen those and get a little more stretch in, we can make things more comfortable and more functional. Anti-inflammatory medicine can be very beneficial. These are things like Advil and Aleve or in prescription strength. So that can control things. Sometimes it's only when I go to play golf or go to play tennis, or sometimes it's every day for a while. These are not benign medicines. They need to be done with caution, but generally they're well tolerated. If you have a big flare up of the knee or it's acutely painful, an injection of corticosteroid can help to bring down that fluid. Sometimes we drain the fluid and then add the cortisone. 
that's like putting a salve on a rash on your leg. It brings down the redness on the inside of the knee and controls the inflammation. So it can help you out of an acute problem. It can help you just before a big event like a wedding or a trip. And it can be a good temporary relief, but it can't be overused. Steroids can have a detrimental effect if used injudiciously. So they have to be done with caution, but they can be very effective. And the last most common accepted form of treatment um, that is used is something called hyaluronic acid, or commonly known as chicken shots or gel shots. And this is a molecule that can be injected inside the knee and can provide some cushion and some lubrication to the knee in simple terms. It probably helps modify the inflammatory response inside the knee, but it's effective and can last as long as six months and can be repeated. So what is knee joint replacement? A lot of people think it's some significant surgery and it's really not that severe. It's still big surgery, but it's considered more of a resurfacing procedure in that we don't take any more than a centimeter of bone with any of the cuts that we make and we shave down the end of the femur bone and we shave off the top of the tibia bone and put a shell on top of the femur and a plate with a post on it to help stabilize it on top of the tibia and a plastic insert goes in between and we're creating a new bearing surface. In so doing, we're also able to realign the knee. We talked a little bit about how the knee can get very bowed or very knock kneed or it might have lost its ability to fully straighten out and fully bend. We can make adjustments as we put the knee in to bring that back to a more neutral alignment. The reason we strive for that is because we want our new mechanical knee loaded evenly. We don't want it point loaded like you've been doing when you've been in a, a bad angle situation and bearing weight on only one point inside the knee. The other very important part of it is we want it to be the same distance apart when your knee is straight as when it's flexed. We call that the extension and flexion gaps. And because we're putting a fixed piece of plastic in there, we need to work hard to get those balanced. One of the developments along the way was something called minimally invasive knee replacement. And really what this was was a chance to scale down the amount of trauma that we did to the knee in order to get the implant in. What this allowed us to do was make smaller incisions, to spare muscle rather than cut through muscle, so we're able to push it aside in some instances as opposed to cutting through it. And by bringing down the size of our instruments that we put inside the knee to guide us, and by being aware that less trauma can lead to faster results, we've been able to have improved results with faster recoveries. This slide shows the example of how long the incision used to be halfway up the thigh and halfway down the tibia, and then on his other side, it's outlined it's about half that size. So big advances in what we're doing there. And then there was talk of the 30-year knee, so now we're getting into implant design and what is the prosthesis made of. So this gets into a biomechanical discussion. We want this knee to be smooth. We want it to be durable. We want it to be biocompatible with the person that we're putting it in. So metal on plastic, which is the most common, has a certain wear characteristic, but polished cobalt chrome is rougher than a substance known as oxidized zirconium. And that is a specialized, it's actually same thing that's in cubic zirconium and it's designed and processed with an elect electronic uh, approach that makes it smoother than polished cobalt chrome. So that lowers the wear of that metal against the plastic. M improving the plastic has been the biggest boon in the past 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years ago when a knee replacement loosened it was because of particulate wear from the plastic, but we've come up with newer techniques that have made the plastic stronger so that they don't create these particles that create an inflammatory response that work in under the prosthesis and there are being revised for reasons other than loosening, so that's been a big boom. So this oxinium on plastic has been touted as the 30-year knee. It works well in the lab. We can put sensors on the knee in the femur and in the tibia and teach the computer where that knee is in space and time 
and give it the parameters from a preoperative study, and then the computer can guide us live as to where those cuts are. Again, helping us with our accuracy. Surgeon preference, technique that works best in whichever surgeon's hands to come out with that combination of realigning the knee and getting those spaces as accurate as possible. This is an example of showing the knee, if you look on the left there, that the knee is in varus or bow-legged and you're seeing a line to the right, that yellow line is the center of the hip to the center of the ankle and that line should drop through the center of the knee, but if you're bow-legged, it's gonna drop on the inside and our goal at surgery is to then correct it so that those lines match up. So what we've been talking about thus far has been total knee replacement. And again, it's total knee resurfacing, if you will. Because of improved techniques, it's been around for a while, we also hear of partial knee replacements. But it requires that your wear problem is limited to one of the three compartments in the knee. There's the inside compartment that you can see on this x-ray, the outside compartment, and the other one is the patellofemoral or kneecap compartment, where the kneecap rides in its groove back and forth. Significant wear in all or two of those makes partial knee replacement less attractive. Why consider partial knee replacement? You could be leaving arthritis behind. You may not completely solve the problem well. It's a smaller operation with a quicker recovery, and it leaves you with more ligaments and natural items inside your knee so that it functions a little bit better. Here's an x-ray that shows the partial knee replacement in place. Again, a runner just on one side, a plate, a little bit of cement you can see down below, but that you can see on the outside of that knee there's a very good joint space so that knee can do well with the smaller procedure. What if we could even make our cuts more precisely? What if we could give even more information to this complex scenario? Because what we can do with this is we get to do a CAT scan of the knee ahead of time and get a lot of data points that show us what that knee looks like. That gets implanted into the computer that talks to the robot. And so live, we can make adjustments in surgery virtually to the computer model. And what if we rotate the femur a little bit this way and the tibia a little this way to get those two gaps, the flexion extension gaps right? And then when we're done, this robotic arm comes in and rather than having to use a guide or anything, it is able to make those cuts precisely because it knows where the femur and the tibia is. So that's been a tremendous boom. Another way to navigate that your surgeon may talk to you about is individualized implant guides. What this means is that rather than put a rod up the stem and drop a jig off of it, we can do an MRI of your knee, get the exact anatomy. That can be translate it into a computer and they can generate a nylon 3D printed model that fits just to your knee. So this all could be taken one step further by individualizing the actual implant. So there is technology that allows us to take a CAT scan of your knee and design a knee that is custom fit just for you. So rather than have picking from sizes one through nine, this one takes in the male-female differences, your particular anatomy differences, and can custom make an implant for you. Another technique to discuss is how we handle the cruciate ligaments. Remember I talked that they're important for controlling things and then in a partial knee replacement you get the benefit of yours working. Now some argue that those ligaments become diseased when the knee becomes deformed and can actually lead to problems. So in a very complex knee, it may be best to sacrifice those knees and put in a device that makes up for them. So if you see here on this slide, there's a little peg that stands up off the tibia and it interacts with the femur as it's going through a range of motion through a couple of posts and it more closely reconstructs that glide slide mechanism of the knee. So that is another technique. So I've talked to you about the fact that we take the anterior cruciate ligaments in most total knees. There is a design when the disease process hasn't involved the ligament significantly that may have some advantages, and this one spares both cruciate ligaments. This is what it looks like on the right. It becomes two sides of the tray rather than the full flat tray, and it kind of goes around the cruciate ligament insertions. 
The downside is that that island that's created can be a little bit fragile and lead to problems. So again, everything has to be individualized. So to summarize, I hope I've helped you to understand the disease process that leads to the need for knee replacement, given some options that you can consider prior to considering knee joint replacement. I've acknowledged that whatever decisions you may be struggling with as to when is time for knee replacement are the same ones we struggle with but will help you to decide when that time is right. And I've given you some exposure to the varying techniques and design processes that go into a successful knee joint replacement. My advice is that you find a surgeon that you trust and then Trust them to help you to decide what the best prosthesis is, but they know what works best in their hands. So they can offer their expertise and work with you to hopefully get you pain-free and on a better path. So thank you very much for joining me today. I'm Dr. Michael Lynch, affiliated with St. Vincent's Medical Center, and appreciate your time.